What evidence will future generations have of my existence? Empty rooms, faded photographs, dilapidated buildings, dust and bones and chiseled stones. The residue of life, a footprint, a census, a statistic, ink drying on a death certificate, filed away and gone forever. This is my story. Uh, but we're just so glad you guys are here with us today to all of our guests. It's an honor to have you spend Mother's Day with us. And if you haven't been here uh, this month, last week we kicked off what is absolutely my favorite series that we've done uh, this year so far. And it's called This Is My Story. And uh, Pastor Brandon kicked it off and did a great job last week talking about uh, that our story matters. And one of the points in his message that was really uh, stuck out to me is that our story is powerful. And the truth is every person in this room has a story. There is something that you have walked through in your life that God is constructing, writing, or building your story. And the truth is, many of us oftentimes don't feel like our story matters. We feel like it's almost insignificant. And when he talked about the power of our story and our story matters, it really just kind of um, it gave us the tools that we needed to say, you know what, maybe I need to sit and kind of collect my thoughts around my story and ask myself, what is my story? What is it that God has, has given me in my life? What are my experiences that maybe God wants me to share with other people? And we actually gave you a resource, and it's available still at our information table today. If you didn't get one last week and you want to go out, it's just a little packet that will help you write your story and kind of give you some ideas of how to sit down and kind of draft out your story. And your story really does matter. And the reason is is because everybody likes a story. We all love to go to the movies. We love to sit and hear somebody that can tell a good story. How many of you like fairy tales? I mean, we grew up on nursery rhymes and fairy tales since we were kids. I mean, everybody likes when the princess kisses the frog and she gets her Prince Charming, right? Everybody likes when Cinderella, you know, finds the prince who has the shoe and then it just all matches up. Everybody likes when, uh, when the beauty meets the beast and somehow it just works. Some people just like when Shrek meets the princess and she'd rather be green and ugly than, you know, be the princess without Shrek. We all love fairy tales. We all love the happy ending. That's the thing that we really like about fairy tales is the happy ending. But, you know, sometimes in life when we think that we're living this fairy tale, especially as children when we think about our future and what we want our life to be, how many of you know that oftentimes our, our future or our present looks a lot different than we thought it was going to look when we were younger or when you were in high school or when you were a kid? Sometimes life just happens. It's like those old commercials, you know, that says life comes at you fast. You know, the lady's like swinging the little kid in the swing, and in the next frame, it's, an, it's a grown adult, you know, knocking down the mother. Life comes at you fast. And the truth is that in this life that we live, all the time life doesn't end in a fairy tale way. And last week you heard several stories on the video from people in Cultivate Church and just their story and their life and, and what they have went through in their life. And there was a lot of ups and downs and we saw how God has helped them. And if you didn't see that, I just encourage you so you all know, uh, you can download the Cultivate Church app on your iPhone or your Android and you can watch all the messages and get more information on your app or you can watch them online if you missed that. Just a powerful week. But this week, I'm just going to take a few minutes if you'll let me and I want to share just a part, a portion of my story with you. And I just want to share with you um, just some experiences of my life and, and a little bit of uh, a bumpy season that I lived through and really some things that God taught me in that season of my life. And God has really shown me some things that, that I experienced to walk through so that I believe that I could come to you today and I could share my experience, my life with you. So that the few people who may be in this room sitting in this auditorium saying, you know what, the, the fairy tale ending hasn't come for me. I feel like, um, you know, the prince shattered the shoe. I feel like, you know, the, the princess who kissed the frog and maybe you got warts instead of a prince. You know, maybe that's where you are today. I kind of think it was the old uh, joke, maybe you've heard it, where a, uh, a patient gets a phone call from the doctor. And when he answers the phone, the doctor says, hey, I've got, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Or I've got bad news, I've got worse news. Any way you want to look at it. And the person goes, well, man, what... What's, what's, give me the best you can give me first. Tell me the, the good stuff. And he says, well, uh, the good news or, the, or the, the bad news is you've got 24 hours to live. So a deep breath comes and the person over the phone says, well, what could be worse than 24 hours left to live? And he says, well, I forgot to call you yesterday. You know, 
For many of you, you feel like that's you. That's your luck. That's the life that you're living. The fairy tale is over, and you're just waiting any day now for that phone call to ring on your number and just say, hey, it's over. It's done. Go ahead and pack it up, mail it home. Let's just call this thing done. But today, I want to encourage you on how to respond and how to act in your life when the fairy tale ends. When the fairy tale comes to an end and it doesn't work like you thought it was going to work. When it doesn't turn out the way you thought it was going to turn out. When you prayed and you asked God, but it just seems like God was through with you. Like he was too busy and he just put you on hold and said, I'll be with you in a moment. You ever been on one of those? It seems like every time you call a customer service, it's like, uh, due to the unusual call volume, it's going to be 30 minutes wait. If you want to wait, fine, we'll get with you when we can. And sometimes that's the way we feel like God is. We say, hey, God, I need you. And we feel like we're on hold waiting. So today, I just want us to pray and ask God to speak to us today. And I want, I want you just to, before we even go into the message, just say, God, what is it today that you need to speak to me about? What is it in this message? You've brought me here today. God's word has been prepared. God, you've got this lined up today, and I know that you've got something for me. And I just want you just to ask God just to speak to you today. And maybe there are some broken places in your life. Maybe you do feel like your fairy tale has just come to an end, that you're in the middle of a life crisis. And just let God's word speak to you and encourage you. Let God's word just breathe new life into you today. Because it's not anything that I say. Listen, church, it has nothing to do with anything that I do this morning. So if you're looking for something from me, just go ahead and shift your focus and say, God, what do you have for me today? And I promise you, if you go into these next few minutes with that attitude and that mindset, God's going to encourage you and you're going to leave differently than you came this morning. So I want to pray for you. God, I love you so much, and we thank you, God, for every person, God, who is in this auditorium and every person who watches by internet. God, we just pray, God, that you just speak to us today. God, we just pray that you would open our ears, that we hear you speaking to us, God. God, we just pray that you open our minds so that we understand what it is that you're saying to us. And God, open our hearts so that we can retain, uh, God, what it is that we need to walk out of here with. So we're not just hearers of the word, but we're doers. And truly, our lives are changed all by the power of your word, by your son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've got your outline, it's in your, um, your worship guide today. I want you to grab that out and just take a few uh, notes with me as we, as we go through these uh, blanks together. But the foundational verse of Scripture that we have on your outline is a verse of Scripture that Pastor Brandon used last week for uh, his message. And this is what it says in Revelations 12 and 11. It says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That they overcame. And this morning, I know every person in here that's walking through whatever season of your life, every one of us want to be overcomers. We want to be able to overcome. But the Bible says that they overcome not just by the blood of the Lamb, not just by what Jesus did alone, but also by the word of their testimony. And this morning, that's what we're talking about. This whole series, it is by the words of our testimony and by the power of Jesus working inside of us. And that verse of Scripture is going to be very important as we go through this message. And I want you to know that as we, before we even talk about this, many of you will question God sometimes. And I'm there. I said, God, why? God, how could you? God, if, if I'm serving you, if I'm doing all of I can, then God, why? Why do I have to go through this? God, why not uh, another way? And the truth is, when you look through Scripture, and you look through what the people that we love to read about and that we pattern our life after, the, the people of God in the Scripture, you see that their lives were not um, just a, a bed of roses, as the old saying goes, all the time. In all reality, they had really hard lives to live. But the most encouragement that we, grow, that we draw out of the Scripture, more often than not, comes out of somebody's really hard time. It comes out of a moment when their fairy tale ended. You know, you think about David, and we love the old story that David slew Goliath, and we, we learned that as children if you grew up in church. And the truth is, we, we like to tell it that he went out there with just a slingshot and a few stones, and he wound it up, and he hit Goliath, and, and it was over. God won the, won the battle. But often we, we kind of neglect to look at the whole story, that David was just a kid, that people were putting him down, people were talking bad about him, that you know, giants weren't just ordinary, that this was a very big deal. He had to walk through risking his life, being made fun of, being put down, being told he wasn't good enough to get to the point to where he could slay Goliath. 
Maybe it's the story of Abraham and Isaac where Abraham takes his only son up to the top of the mountain because God told him to. And he's going to sacrifice his son because that's what God told him to do. Until an angel comes and intervenes and rescues Isaac. And, and because uh, Abraham was faithful and did what God asked him to do, God stepped in and intervened. You know, we love the story. We say, yes, God will intervene on our behalf. But when you neglect the fact of the matter that the story goes, that Abraham had to walk up the hill with his only son, and he had to experience it and walk through it. It's often during the greatest adversity or the greatest trials of our lives where God is able to build the most integrity and character and trust and faith in him. That's where we learn, that's where we build, and that's where we grow. It's in those moments where you can't and only God can it's in the moments of your life where you say, God, I've done it all. Now I need you. How many times have you been there? How many times have you, I'm, I'm so guilty. God, I've done all I know to do. I can't figure this thing out. So obviously I'm going to need your help. And God was saying all along, that's what I was waiting on. I was waiting on you. I need your help. And I learned this kind of the hard way in just a, just a moment in my life, just a season that I went through. And I'll just tell you a little bit about how my fairy tale began. You know, we've all got those stories where our fairy tale begin. And I was about 18 years old. I was a, a new high school graduate, ready to chase the world, just whatever, you know, opportunities on the horizon. People said great things. You know, you graduated, you got all the encouragement. And uh, about six months into... Uh, into summer or right after graduation not six months in but uh, six months into that year around the, the month of June I um, felt like God had spoke to me while I was in high school the last few weeks that I was going to put together a tent revival and I don't know if you guys know what a tent revival is but it's basically you put a tent up outside uh, in the elements and you just invite people to come out and we're going to have church on the side of the road in a tent and as crazy as that is, uh, Pastor Brandon Doss, we did it together. We put this thing on, and we had 150, 200 people come every night on the side of the road in Pinson, Alabama, and hear the gospel. And uh, during that week, uh, we just learned a lot of new friends, made a lot of people. Brandon and I became really close friends during that, that summer and that season. But one of the things that was, that was so great about 2001, in my senior year, there was three pivotal things that happened in my life that kind of set my fairy, fairy tale life in order. One of the first things that happened was I went into full-time ministry that summer when I was 18. And I never thought that would happen. I was, you know, making plans to do what I felt like God wanted me to do and in the direction. But God just opened up a door that I got to step into. And it set the course of my ministry in motion. And that was a big moment for me to be able to step into a place of full-time ministry. The second big thing that happened that year that was really pumping my fairy tale moment was that my mom and dad gave their heart to God after about 13 years of me praying for my parents. They came to know Jesus for the first real time in their life. And, uh, and then the third thing that happened to me that summer was I met a, a young girl that would eventually become my wife and who I would eventually marry. And in 2001, uh, the, God just began to set my life just on a, just a great path. I mean, it just began to, the fairy tale just began to grow and began to build. And, uh, and, and, and God was just, um, just really blessing. And then in 2005, I actually got married and, uh, and proposed. And she said yes. And you know how that, that goes when you get up the nerve and you finally do it. And the answer is yes. And then, uh, so in 2005, I got married and bought this little townhouse. It was a fixer-upper, and, you know, I had to go in and paint and rip up floor. You know, all the stuff that you're just excited to do when you're beginning life. And God is setting your, your fairy tale in order. And so for the next, uh, you know, two, three years, God was just really blessing. We were doing youth ministry and uh, my wife and I, and, and God was just really just blessing us. Students were coming, and kids were being saved. And, you know, I've learned you be careful what you ask out of God. And a prayer that I said was, God, just send me the people that nobody else wants. And uh, how many of you know that God will answer your prayer? And how many of you know there's a reason that nobody else wants them? <laughs> just being honest. Great people, but God just answered those prayers. We were able to help people that were just, just really at the, at the bottom, people that just had absolutely no hope. And really, I was thinking, you know, God, I'm just so blessed, God, that you would just that you would that you would speak into my life, that you would allow me to be used, and you would bless me in such a, an amazing way. And honestly, life was everything that I ever dreamed it could be, everything that I'd ever hoped for in my life. God was just I just I couldn't believe it that God was allowing me to live my fairy tale life. But how many of you know? Sometimes when things go up, they eventually come back down. 
And my fairy tale in 2007 actually kind of began to end. And it was right around Christmas time when my fairy tale kind of became to a, a screeching halt, and I could tell that, you know, one of the engine planes were out, and we were, we were going down very fast. And the way it happened was it was really close to Christmas time, the week before Christmas. And uh, Pastor Brandon Doss and I were on staff at a church together, the same church, and it was Christmas time, so we had done these Christmas productions, and we'd been out with some equipment that we had rented, and we had returned that equipment, and we were really excited because the program was awesome. And uh, we were just celebrating all day out, returning and running errands. And at the end of the day, he and I had walked into Walmart together. And uh, it was just a great day. We were having fun. It was a laid-back day. And we walked into the line of Walmart about to pay. And this may sound crazy to some of you, but it's just the truth, and, and I can just remember it like it happened yesterday. As we stand there and, and we're talking, this feeling comes over me. Like, I just can't explain why it came. I can't explain, I can't explain even the, the way I totally felt to you. But you ever know that moment where you feel all the blood drain out of your body and your, your stomach just sinks and all of a sudden you feel sick and you feel nauseous? In a blink of an instant, in the middle of a conversation, laughing, that's, that just feeling, just, it just came over me. And I looked at Brandon and I said, Brandon, I said, something is wrong. I said, something is horribly wrong bad wrong and you just got to know Brandon's a real sensitive guy just you know listens to God so much that he just looked at me and just began to laugh at me you know he just starts laughing and I'm thinking okay can you not lend some support here I'm not kidding something is wrong can you not see I'm pale and he starts laughing he says what are you talking about obviously it didn't make sense right there in the moment but I knew something was wrong well, when I got home that evening, I walked in my house. Sitting on my couch was, was my wife, right to my left, sitting there. And as soon as I walked in the door, it's as if everything in that room vanished and a bright light just, just hovered around her as she sat there on that couch. And in a moment, I knew whatever was going on, that was, that was the issue. There was something there that was not right. So I said, hey, what's, what's going on? I said, what's, what's wrong? She just looked at me and she said, you know, I'm, I'm just not feeling good. I, I just, I've just had a bad day. I don't feel very good. And something inside of me said, that's not it. I said, I said, no, I said, there's something wrong. Tell me what it is. What is it? And over the next few seconds, as I just continued to ask and to prod, and, and uh, you know, I, I guess you could say, you know, maybe my, my temper got up a little bit, and I was like, you've got to tell me what's wrong. And finally, she looks up at me and she says, I'm not the person that you think I am. I said, what in the world are you talking about? So she proceeds to tell me that um, for, for quite some time there had been an affair going on behind my back. I knew nothing about it. See, again, I think, man, this is the fairy tale life. All is good. Everything is good. I said, what in the world? What do you mean? And long story short, the, the story was kind of fabricated, and over a course of a few weeks, um, the story kind of continued to grow, and really the real truth began to sneak out a little more and a little more. And, but I'm just going to be honest with you. In, uh, in my family, uh, what happened that night when she told me that, uh, that, that an affair had been going on, um, I, what, what would happen would that you'd say in my family that the Matthews came out a little bit in me. And, and if you don't know what the Matthews is, let's just say maybe a Jerry Springer moment kind of came out, Okay. Uh, you know, because it wasn't a pretty sight. Um, I got on the phone, and uh, I called, you know, Brandon Doss. I was like, man, you're not going to believe this. And, and, of course, he's just devastated. So he comes over to my house. And when he arrives, um, I had already been to the top of the stairs and cleaned out uh, my wife's closet for her. Uh, all of her clothes were at the bottom of the stairs, packed, you know, st packed up to the door. And I was like, you got to go. I was like, that's it. I was like, you know, and when we got married, I told you the one thing that I, I just couldn't handle would be this. So, uh, you know, I'm just devastated. I'm floored. I'm absolutely floored. A million different emotions began to just surge through my mind and through my body. I'm thinking, my gosh, I, I can't believe this. The first thing that goes through my mind is, I'm one of the, the only Christians out of my immediate family who's lived life as a Christian, done, tried to do their best their whole life. God, I've served you and out of the majority of my overall family that are not believers, that are not Christians, how am I going to be the one that's about to end up this way? And then I thought, God, my, 
my ministry, what I've lived for, what, what you've allowed me to do, my dream to serve people and to serve you, it's over. God, it, it's shattered. It will never move from this moment. God, how in the world? And that night I spent in my living room on my couch alone and, and just feeling absolutely uh, abandoned, feeling just absolutely shattered, thinking, God, what in the world am I going to do? And I was mad, I was angry, I was disappointed. I was every emotion that you've experienced in times of your life and every emotion that you could imagine. And I remember coming to a moment in that night when I said, God, what do you want me to do? And the only scripture, you know how God sometimes gets you with those scriptures that you really don't want to hear, don't want to remember? God said, you need to love your wife as Christ loved the church. And Christ gave his life for the church. So must you give your life for your wife. And you've got to do all that you can do. And it was in that moment that my journey began. And God began to teach me a few things. So number one on your outline, I want, to write you, I want you to write something down that I want to give to you today. The first thing that you need to do when the, when the fairy tale ends is you need to surrender. You need to surrender. See, it was at the moment as I laid on that couch talking and asking God, what in the world do you want me to do? See, he spoke. And that was in that moment where I had to fully surrender to God for him to be able to speak to me. Because all I could hear was my thoughts. All I could hear was my flesh. All I could hear was the Matthews, you know, in me saying, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take care of this. Is, we're not going to... All of these things coming in my mind. And finally, I just had to surrender myself and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Obviously, if everything that I've believed, everything that I've taught with my life, this is the moment, this is the time where I have to trust. And I've got to surrender myself and say, God, what do you want me to do? And Jesus, I know, felt something similar in the scripture. I put it on your outline it says this, it says, Jesus went on a little farther and he fell to the ground and he prayed that if there was another way possible that the awful hour awaiting him might pass by. And he said, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done and not mine. Jesus was at a moment where he was crushed, where he knew life was about to close in on him and he began to pray. But he said, God, whatever it is that you want, what is your plan in this? What is it that you are putting together? And I want you to know this morning that if you're in the moment of crisis in your life and you feel like today that your fairy tale is coming to an end, that everything is closing in around you and you don't know the first step to take, I would just tell you the first step to take is just to surrender to God. To say, God, here I am. You need to speak. You need to give me direction. And number two, the second thing you need to do is when God speaks to you, you need to obey. You need to be obedient. The Bible says this, what's more pleasing to God, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than the offerings of rams. Meaning this, that you can do and you can do and you can do. And you can know and you can know and you can know. But the difference maker is when you obey is that when God says it and you act on it, even when it's hard. And as I laid there and that conviction just began to come over me, the very next morning I had a phone call that I had to make. And it was to my wife. And I called her and I said, listen, I, whatever it takes, I want to I I work this out. We can, we can get past this. We can, we, can, we can work through this thing, whatever it takes. If we need to go to counseling, if we need to get advice from people around us, whatever it takes. And I even made this statement. I said, I said, if I said, if what's led up to some of the, whatever the case may be, if if I need to, if I need to resign from, from the church, if we need a break just to focus on whatever we gotta do, I'm in. I'll do it, whatever it takes. Because I had to be obedient to God. Long story short. She comes back home. Several weeks go by. Man, we go to counseling. We're talking to people. I think everything is on the up and up. We are, we are working through this. We're, we're going to make it. It's going to be okay. And it felt like that there was some repentance taking place, and it was all good. And then on Christmas morning, I open up a, find a card in, in, in our home that was from 
the guy who the affair had been taking place with, realized that that was a, a, a recent card, and uh, also checked uh, some phone records and realized that over a course of about four weeks as we moved into the new year, nothing had changed. Nothing was, uh, was happening at all. So I come to the place where I said, okay, God, I've been obedient. Now, now what is it that, what's the next step? What do you need to do? And I understand that God's principle says that, that, that you've got you to be willing to do your part in what you do. That God is available for us when we are submitted to him and we're walking toward God. But when we walk away from God, there's nothing that he can force on us to do. So I made a decision and I said, all right, we, we need to... We need to we need to separate. You, you need to go you know, to your parents and hang out until you decide what it is that, that you need to do. Because I've made my decision. I told you, I'm in. I'm willing to work. I'm, I'm going to be obedient to God. Let's do whatever it takes. Long story short, several you know, months go by, several weeks in time, and, and she finally comes to the conclusion and just says, I don't want this. I want, to, I want to leave. I want out. So that's what she does. She comes to the house, packs up all of her stuff, and, uh, and, and moves it all out. The whole time as she packs and as she's moving, I'm looking at her saying, you don't have to do this. I want you to know you don't have to do this. It does not have to be this way. It, we can still make it work. This can still happen. You don't have to do it. But it was her decision to make, and she chose it. And she left, and there I was, devastated, knowing that I was about to be a young guy out of a seven-year relationship, married nearly three years, about to be divorced. Not only about to be divorced, but the first person in my entire family, of whom are mostly not Christians, to be divorced. And I looked at God and I said, God, how in the world can you make sense of this? God, tell me what good will ever come out of this. All of these students, God. There's a hundred kids here that I've, got, that I've got responsibility and leadership in that I've influenced their life, and, and this is going to be the example of it all. God, tell me how. How do we do this? How do we get past this? Number three, I want you to write this down on your outline. When the fairy tale ends, you need to begin to worship. And as myself was done, at this moment, church, let me, let me just be honest with you. I, I was spent. I was done. I was devastated. There was absolutely no want to in me at all. But as I began just to spend time alone with God, and I had several songs that they were just some of my favorites at the moment, and I would just sit sometimes in my living room alone, and I would just play those songs. I wouldn't say a word. I wouldn't even say a word to God. But those songs would just play. And as they began to play and talk about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God, and as those songs and those words and those lyrics began to fill me up, and the presence of God just to begin to come in my house, just me and God, it renewed the strength that was in me. It reminded me of all the times that God had been faithful. It reminded me of all the times that I had failed, but God had still been true. And in those moments when I began to get past myself and my circumstance, when the focus was moved from me to God, God began to speak and move to me. It's one of my favorite verses of Scripture, favorite stories in Scripture is in Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas are in prison, and the Bible says this, At about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, not only they were in prison, but they were in the center of the prison. They were in the worst of the worst. There was no light. I mean, there was no TV. There was nothing good about this situation. Here are two guys who were put in prison because they were preaching the Word of God, and now they're being punished because of serving their life with God. But about midnight, I mean, you know that midnight is the darkest hour. It's the point to where all seems lost. It's the moment of night when you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel like nobody's with you, nobody's around when you're all alone, when all of your friends have gone to bed, when, when the world has calmed and it's just you and your feelings and your emotions and your stuff. But about midnight, Paul and Silas began to worship. And if you finish the rest of the story, the Bible says that the, that the prison walls began to fall. And they all began to crumble. And can I tell you that when I began to pick myself up and I began to worship and move my focus from me and my stuff and me wallowing in my own shame and pity and hurt, and I started looking to God, God began to move inside of me. 
and your fairy tale ends and you surrender and you obey, you need just to begin to live a life of worship. That's why we worship when we come in here every week. We worship first, not just because it's something we do or that's just a tradition. We come in here and we worship first because we are preparing the presence of God. God responds to your worship. And when we come in this room and when we begin to sing and we begin to clap and I lift my hands, not out of tradition or something that I do because it's church, when I lift my hands to God, I say, God, I'm, I'm surrendered. If a cop, you know, tries to arrest somebody, what do they say? Put your hands in the air. It's a sign of surrender. This is the moment that I just say, God, I'm surrendered wholly, completely, totally to you. And when we begin to worship, the presence of God is able to come in and it's able to move and worship is powerful. Number four, here's the next step, and it's hard. When your fairy tale ends, you've got to forgive. You've got to be able to forgive. The Bible says this, he fell on his knees, cried out, and said, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. This was a servant of God. His name was Stephen. He loved Jesus. He followed Jesus, served Jesus, gave Jesus his life. And because he was proclaiming the gospel, the penalty, the punishment, was he was stoned to death. All the officials gathered large stones, stood around him, and they beat him until he died. That was the punishment for proclaiming the word of God. But his last words, he just said, God, forgive them. God, forgive them. And I don't know about you, but it's hard to forgive. But I'll never forget July 4th, 2008. And I knew God was working in me. And I knew that if I was going to begin to heal, if I knew if I was going to begin to really be able to trust God and follow, I had, a, I had something hard that I had to do. And I picked up the phone and I made a phone call. And when she answered the phone, I just said, I need to tell you something. I said, I just want you to listen. I got a few things. I don't want a conversation. Let me just tell you this and then we're going to be done with this conversation. I said, I want you to know that I forgive you. I said, I want you to know that what I want for you is to somehow pick up the pieces of your life and to be able to fall in love with Jesus like you were or like the person that I knew. And I just want you to know that I forgive you. I don't hold any grudge. I don't hold any anger. And I just pray God's blessing for you and that God is able to do great things in your life. And that was the end of the conversation. Now let me tell you, there is nothing inside of me that was able to just me to do that. It's nothing more than the presence and the power of God. And let me tell you this, when I spoke forgiveness on that end of the phone, I don't know what it did. I don't know if it did anything. The lifestyle, and the choices that she was making, the things that she was doing, none of it changed. But let me tell you this, for me, everything changed. It was like a load had been lifted off my shoulders and I could breathe again. God had been giving me strength and God had been helping me. But it's all alone like I needed those, those bursts, those shots of energy just to be alone with God. But at the moment that I was able to say, I forgive you, it set me free. The chains fell off of me and I could breathe again. I could live again. And I want you to know this morning, there are some of you who are being held captive in bondage because of unforgiveness in your life. And I encourage you not to let unforgiveness kill you. The things of yesterday, you just need to let them go. You need to sweep them under the rug. Even the things that may not be resolved, you need to come to a place to say, you know what, we're going to start here and start fresh. And I'm going to tell you, you can't do it no easier than I could do it. But because of Jesus and the power of God helping me, he can also help you and do the same for you. This was my journey. The next thing that I had to do was this, number five, is I had to begin to serve. I had to begin to do something. I mean, it was me and God, and I was, he was helping me. My focus was on him, but I wasn't doing anybody else any good. I wasn't, I wasn't contributing to anything that mattered on any weekly basis at that moment because I had been so focused on me and my time and my healing and my life. I had to, I had to shake it off. I had to begin to... Do something for myself so that I could do something for God. And I want to read a verse of Scripture to you, and I think this verse of Scripture is so powerful. 
It says this, feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then, notice, feed and do. Stop sitting, stop just consuming. Do something. Then, I love this, your light will shine out from the darkness. And the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The darkness that you feel like you're sitting in today because your fairy tale has come to an end. and Everything is around you that's dark. Here's what I encourage you to do. Begin to serve. Use the gifts and the abilities that God's give you to advance the kingdom and to bless people. Because when you begin to serve, it becomes about everybody else and not about you. And because it becomes about everybody else, God's able to bless you. For the measure you give, it will be given back to you. So I just found ways to serve. I got connected with the church that I would eventually go on staff at. And I would show up for things just because they let me be there. You know, they didn't mind me being there. I love the people. I love the church. So if I can move a chair, I, I found joy and, and happiness out of moving a chair. If a bag of garbage was dripping and needed to go out somewhere, let me take the garbage. Whatever it takes, let me do something. I just need to begin to serve and to give my life to something that matters. And there are some of you that come here every week and you think, man, I need to be doing something. Or I, I want to be, I want my gifts to be used. I want to matter. I want to do something. Let me tell you, let us help you. Don't sit back and, and let the enemy rob you of the blessing of giving your life. To serve something that matters. It's not about the church. It's not about giving to the church. It's about giving to God and just letting the church be a vehicle for it. Because when you begin to serve, all the darkness that surrounds you begins to vanish because light begins to flood its way in. Not only does it light your path, not only does it give you encouragement when it begins to light up the room, but it's light to other people. It matters to the people around you. The next thing I would tell you is number six, when the fairy tale ends, you need to grow. You need to grow. It's a hard statement and a hard question to ask yourself, but let me ask you this question. If you're still in this room today, and you are still bogged down by things that happened five years ago, ten years ago, if in your marriage you are still rehashing everything from back when you met, and this thing or that thing, let me just tell you what you need to do. You need to grow. You need to grow. We need to grow up a little. The Bible says that, you know, we only stay on the milk so long. And we got to move to some meat. Let me tell you, when you walk through something, God's expecting you to grow out of it. God doesn't want you to sit and just lay around in it. He wants you to grow so that you can be better, so that he can make you who he wants you to be. Listen to the verse of Scripture. Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. You need to grow. Let God stretch and grow you. And the last thing I'll say on your outline is this. Number seven is you need to share. You need to share. The Bible says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to share. Now, I know your excuses right now. I could never open up my closet. I could never share what's happened in my life. You, uh, you have no idea how intimidated I am. What will people think of me? What will people say? Let me tell you guys this this morning. I felt those same feelings, same thoughts, and those same emotions all month long that I knew that I was going to share my story with you. What will people think? What will, what will, you know, what will be perceived? But let me tell you, I am made an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of my testimony. And today, yeah, it's okay. You can clap. Amen. And let me tell you this, when I leave out of here today, the enemy's got two big old black eyes from me because I didn't let him stop it. I didn't let him stop me. 
And let me tell you this. God has redeemed me. Everything that the enemy t took from me, God has restored back to more than I could have ever thought or ever imagined. I wouldn't trade my life or the experiences of it for anything in this world. I am a blessed, blessed person. And let me tell you the process. You've got to be willing to share. This morning, the big idea that I want to leave with you, and these steps are my personal journey. This was my personal journey that I gave you this morning that will help some of you. And some of you will walk through some of this, and this is going to be an encouragement to you. But the big idea that I want to leave you with today is this right here is that you need to be able to share your story. Don't let fear, don't let worry, don't let doubt stop you. Pastor Brandon told us last week, your story matters. We gave you a resource so that you could begin to map out your story. And I want to encourage you this week, ask God to help you to begin to share your story. We'll help you do it if you want to, if you want to write it out, if you want to, post it, if you want to do a video, if you just want us to help you prepare it so that you can share it with your family, your friends, you need to be able to share your story. But this morning, I want to pray before I, before I dismiss, and I want to pray two things. One, I want to pray for every person in here that maybe you're struggling this morning. You just, you just need God to, to help you. But the other thing is, is you're here and you're struggling, and the first thing that I told you is you got to surrender to God. Maybe you're here and you've never surrendered to God. And today would be the day that you want to give your life to him. I just want to ask you if everybody would just to bow their heads, close your eyes for just a second. And I want to pray for you. And just really quick, if you're in this room and you'd say, hey, that's me, Pastor Brandon. I want to, I want to give my heart to God today. I've never surrendered to him. And I want to start there. Today's the moment that I feel like I need to give God 100% of my life. If that's you, I just want you to throw your hand up and just bring it right back down. I won't embarrass anybody. I won't call any names. I won't come get you. All I want you to do is just slip up your hand, just so I know who I'm praying for. That's all. And I can see the hands. I see your hand. Anybody else? Just really quick. Don't walk out of here without making that commitment. If that's what God's put on your heart today. Amen. I'm going to pray for those who said, yes, I want to give my heart to God. If you don't know how to pray, just follow my lead. Pray as I pray, but just... Open your heart to God. And then I'm going to pray for the rest of you in here. If you want to be included in this prayer and you say, Hey, Pastor Brandon, I do. I feel like my fairy tale's in a bad place. It's not the fairy tale that I would have imagined. If that's you and you want me to just include you in this prayer, I just want you to throw up your hand just so I can see who I'm praying for. There's hands from the front to the back all over. God's going to, God's going to help you today. You're going to leave differently than you came. Father, I thank you for every person in this room. God, for the people who said yes to you today, God, we just pray right now that you just forgive us of our sins. God, we've tried to do it on our own, and we can. We give you our heart. We give you our life. Forgive us. Jesus, come live inside of us. We give you our life today. We commit to you everything. And Jesus, for those who are here that says, you know what, I just need some encouragement. I need God to help me. My fairy tales, not the fairy tale that I imagined. God, I just pray for strength. I pray for encouragement. God, I pray for people to be dedicated to you. God, for people today to start serving, serve their way out of it, to begin growing, to connect into a small group, to grow with people and build relationships so we can do life together so that we can be overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. In Jesus' name.